Do you want to say my name is David Ocker or no? Oh, I guess I could do yeah, that. That'd be fine. Okay, go for it. Okay. I'm David Ocker, and I'm really looking forward to joining you Wednesday night. I'm going to start out the event by telling you some things about Jennifer. Some of those things will surprise you. And then I'm going to show you an amazing story. And I'm going to talk about why that story is so amazing and so effective and how organizations use stories like that to communicate a strategic message. I'll also be talking about signature stories, but in the context of, of individuals, not organizations. So what we wanted you to do is actually share some questions you might have for either of us, right? So what kind of questions might you like? Yeah, I think that some questions about how signature stories used in your organization or, or how you, the problems you might have in getting signature stories into the mix. And, uh, and Jennifer would probably be interested in signature stories as it applies to your own personal life. Which might be more interesting in some ways. Uh, we invite you actually to submit six word stories to us um, before, before the session. In fact, we might even have an award for the best six word story that you the submit. Dragonfly effect. It may or may not be a book. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so please give us some questions before the event or share your own six word stories about your organizations or yourself. And I uh, just wanted to say that both Jennifer and I have uh, a lot of uh, ties and a lot of affection for both Haas and Stanford. And so we're delighted to be in the company of, uh, of people that also have ties and affection for Stanford and Berkeley. Go Bears and Cardinal. Go Cardinal. Go Cardinal. Is there such a, and Bears. Is there such an expression, go Cardinal? Tree, go tree. Go tree. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to all of you to this wonderful event bringing us together. This is our 15th, our 15th annual Berkeley Haas celebration here at the Gap headquarters. We're, we're really honored to be part of the, the vision. Most of you know, or many of you knew Don Fisher, uh, his vision, not just for this company, but uh, also at Berkeley Haas and, and for society more generally. It's just a, a perfect venue for us to showcase uh, Berkeley Haas and also to, to showcase Stanford GSB. So welcome also to all of our colleagues and friends at Stanford GSB. And for those of you that are here from Stanford, please look around the room, see how much red is being worn. This is even by Berkeley people. So this is, um, this is a very special night for you. This year, we spotlight the research, as you know, and insights of a father-daughter marketing pair that uh, have just been remarkable contributors to both of these institutions. Berkeley Haas is Professor Emeritus David Ocker and his daughter at Stanford GSB, uh, Jennifer Ocker. David and Jennifer will discuss the importance of signature stories. What are our signature stories? I mean, I hope all of us will leave the room thinking a little bit more about what our signature stories are. I certainly, when I thought about this topic, uh, had to think about that, and we'll talk more about that. How do we create them? How do we keep them alive? Where does their emotional impact come from? And how do they, how do they serve us? How do they help us move the world in the direction that we hope to move the world? As you'll see here from the program slide, on this, uh, you'll hear from both of them, and we'll get a chance to use some of the questions that you've submitted already to hear from them uh, on questions as well. So I'm going to introduce David, the Vice Chairman of Profit Brand uh, Strategy, and as I mentioned, Professor Emeritus at Berkeley Haas. Uh, David is the recipient of four career awards for contributions to the practice and science of marketing, most recently being the Nyama Marketing Hall of Fame. He's published over 100 articles. He's published over 17 books. Uh, he has sold over a million copies of books, um, some of the popular ones that many of you studied, some of you when you were at Berkeley. Uh, strategic uh, Market Management, Building Strong Brands, Brand Relevance, his latest book, Ocker on Branding, and this one pretty much sums up a lot of the others. So if you're going to get one, get the latest Get the latest one. It's, uh, it's been helpful to me. It really is. Uh, it's, it's, as, as a non-marketing person, just a very quick story, if I may. My office, when I came back to, I was an undergrad at Berkeley. I got to come back to Berkeley in 1993 as a faculty member, and that was a dream come true. And in 1993, we were still in Barrows. And so they, they said, you know, that's your office. And the guy next to me was 
David Auker. And I got to know David Auker as my office mate. And, and, and we became quite good friends. And I got to meet Jennifer, I remember, in that, in that uh, Barrow's office together. So, uh, so I have a, a, a connection with David. And I think he helped me to think a little bit about the importance of marketing, which is not where I come from. Uh, so he's a recognized authority, obviously, on brand strategy and really just a worldwide uh, expert in this area. Please join me in welcoming our own David Auker. Thank you, David. Thanks, Rich. Well, thanks for coming. I want to start out by giving an example of a signature story. And uh, as you watch this video, think to yourself, is this, to me, intriguing? Does this feel authentic? Is this involving? Does it draw me in? So can you play the video? Ah! Push! Push! Ayo tidur tari, biar besok bisa bangun pagi. Besok dia akan ulang tahun. Besok hari penting buatku. Usia aku lima tahun. Tidurannya anakku. Isn't that incredible? I'm going to make four observations about this signature story. First of all, it's really powerful. It is intriguing. Don't you wonder what Otari was doing, being so obsessed with the tree and taking care of the tree? And, uh, and then we get kind of a, a, a surprise. We find out that that tree she marked when, her, when she knew she was going to have a baby. And that tree has been the symbol of the baby's growth. And now the baby reached five. And, uh, uh, and, and isn't it authentic? It, uh, we get to know Atari. We get to know her father. We even see the village that we're living in. It is nothing but real. It has to be authentic to us. It, uh, and, and third, it's involving, isn't it? You get drawn in. You get emotionally involved in the, in the, in the whole story. And uh, you really care. So it's powerful. Second thing is that it communicates facts. Now, we know from all kinds of research that if you put uh, facts out there, you know, a list of four or five or six, seven facts, like two million children are, die before the age of five, and, uh, and uh, there's a Life Boy program that involves all kinds of things in the school and out of the school, and that will affect this mortality. You put a bunch of facts out there, people don't attend to them. They don't notice them. Their brain kind of says, 
you know, here's three or four or five facts. Should I process them? I'll probably forget them. I, they probably won't have any use for me. I'll just ignore them. Facts get ignored. And the worst thing is, even if they get processed, even if people, for one reason or another, process these facts, they don't persuade. And there's a several reasons for that, but one of them is you have counter-arguing. When you see facts, the natural inclination is to say, you know, this guy's trying to persuade me. What is he not telling me? You know, uh, maybe five million children. How does he know it's five million children? Where does he get the data? And how do you know that this washing hands is going to affect that and how much it'll affect it? Maybe it'll just have a tiny effect. There's counter-arguing. So now think, uh, enter a story. So instead of pretty, uh, the facts, we tell a story. And, uh, and what, what we can do is we can slip the facts into the story. So when you hear the story, you come to know that there's a problem with infant mortality. And it's related to hand washing. And so they slip that in. And, but even more important, they, uh, they set you up so now the facts are relevant. So now you're willing to process facts. And you remember them because they're, they're attached to the story. So we have some facts that are kind of within the story, but then we have some facts at the end. And the story motivates you to process those facts. The third thing is that this video is incredibly successful. 11 million people watch this video. And it costs nothing for Lifeboy to put it out there. 11 million people watched it. And not only that, but there was two companion videos one of them had a uh, girl named Shaka that was seven years old. And she represented an unborn baby projected forward seven years. So she was sort of uh, not a ghost, but a projection commenting on her seven years that hadn't occurred yet, but will occur. And she talked to her, it was a, she was talking to her mother, and she talked about how she sang lullabies, how she read stories, and how she washed her hands. And the girl was so grateful that her mother had done that. That got 14 million views. The three of them together got 44 million views. And that doesn't count all the... Uh, um, all the uh, sort of press results or press accounts of this whole program and these signature stories within this program. Um, and, and it also created a, a nice feeling. You watch this, this, this video and you feel good, don't you? You feel good about the program, Help a Child Reach Five. You feel good about Life Boy. And there's some people that even feel good about Unilever. But most people don't know Life Boy is made by Unilever. Unilever, incidentally, is, is, is a company I admire more than any other because of their philosophy of business. It's quite remarkable. Um, but that, that feeling in the video gets transferred to the brand. And, and we know that's true. Again, uh, hundreds of research studies. We know if you like an ad, you're going to like the brand that did the ad. It, that, it, there's, it gets transferred. We know that. Um, and it was successful in helping this program help a child reach five. Uh, because Lifebuoy is one half of their goal of getting a billion people to change their hand washing habits. They're halfway there after eight years. And this video helped them get there. Fourth thing I wanted to say is that this is a signature story. And a signature story is intriguing, gets attention. It is authentic. And that means that thing, words like phony, selling, this is just a selling job, they don't enter your mind if it's authentic. It's involving. That means you get drawn in. And that's one of the most powerful characteristics in any story. Um, 
And it's a narrative. That means it's sort of once upon a time, this happened and then that happened. And uh, it's, uh, it's not a set of facts. And it, takes, it has a strategic message. In this case, the strategic message is about uh, you know, explaining the, the infant mortality rate, the fact that the hand washing can, can prevent that, and there is a program. It's help a child reach five. And it's done by Lifebuoy. Um, and it, I should say also, it's a strategic story for this program, Help a Child Reach Five. It's a strategic story for Lifebuoy, the brand Lifebuoy. And in some cases, and for some people, it's a signature story for Unilever. If you look at the Unilever annual report, you'll see a reference to this story. Um, so why, why do we use signature stories for firms? Let me give you two reasons. First of all, again, there's study after study after study, probably 500 studies, that, that demonstrate vividly that if you compare facts to a story that has the same general content, a story will be, uh, get more attention. It will, be, uh, it will persuade. It will change perceptions. It will be remembered. And it will be passed on, much more than facts. And these, we're not talking about a little bit of an improvement. We're talking about orders of magnitude, two times, five times, 10 times. And the second reason we use signature stories, come back to the digital world we're living in. When market, marketers struggle, how do we cope with the digital world? Things are different. My take on digital is that content is king, and content means stories. So company after company are learning that uh, it's, it's good to actually hire journalists, have a little department, and create and manage stories. So let me... Uh, let me uh, now turn to introducing Jennifer. I have to say that I have mixed feelings about having such an accomplished daughter. <laughs> On one hand, it's, uh, I get some reflected glory because people think I had something to do with that, <laughs> which is not true, but it doesn't affect the fact I still get reflected glory. But there's some issues. You know, first of all, people call me up regularly. I mean, honest to God, they call me up and say, Jennifer is busy. Would you like to speak on <laughs> And I used to be the, the you know, the, the primary speaker. Now I'm kind of the warm-up act. <laughs> and just literally two weeks ago, my friend and colleague, Scott Davis, was on a conference call with me. And, and he uh, said, Dave, I've got to tell you a story. My son, Ben, is in the business school at Indiana. And I said to him, I know what's coming now. I hear this all the time. His professor is using my book. Or his professor has said something about one of my ideas. He said, his professor played a five-minute video on humor from Jennifer Ocker. And it was terrific. And isn't that the daughter of your friend? And then, in the same conversation, same conversation, Scott said, well, your new book on, I'm writing a book on strategic stories. That's going to be my next book. I expanded an article Jennifer and I did for California Management Review into a book. And uh, he said, you've got to call it Ocker on Strategic Stories. Because, you know, you've got Ocker on branding. Ocker on strategic, then you have Ocker on, you can have a whole bunch of books. And it would be a series. And I thought, that was a really great idea. But then I thought, you know, most people are going to think, Jennifer finally wrote a second book. <laughs> and my wife suggested, why don't you call it Ocker on strategic stories? <laughs> um, and, but I tell you, working with Jennifer is not a walk in the park. <laughs> she is very opinionated. 
And, and we have these vigorous conversations about issues we disagree on, and they always end one of three ways. She will send after finds she'll get exhausted, and she'll say, Dad, you've got to stop being repetitive. <laughs> or she will say, Dad, you've got to work on your listening skills. <laughs> but the worst is, I'll, I'll be in a situation where I'll tee up some, I'll, I'll crystallize three reasons why her position is just flat wrong. And anybody could see that. And just as I get into that, she'll say, got to go, love you. <laughs> and, and I'm talking to dead air. No, she's a really a, amazing person. She is, she's literally opened the uh, th five research areas for her field, like brand personality, cross-cultural uh, research, and humor, and meaningfulness. And, uh, and she's just a wonderful person. She's the most caring, empathetic person I know. And she's my best friend. After my mom, Jan, and Jolynn. After the three of you, then I'm his best friend. I'm just saying that, like, you know. Um, uh, so thank you, Dad. Uh, it's totally true that my favorite way to end a conversation with my dad is, gotta go. Uh, I love you. Um, and so I'm, I'm really honored to be here today. There's so many people in the room that I recognize, and, um, and um, I really wanted to say, Thank you, not just to my dad, who I think we all, can we just all say, like, who does not love Dave Ocker? Yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. It's so funny, like, I, I saw a few of you before, and you're like, you know, you're talking about how great Dave is, and, and, um, and I'm like, yeah, I gotta go. <laughs> you know, I go talk. Um, so you are so beloved um, and have had such impact, it's amazing. I also wanted to thank um, my sister Jan and JoLynn, Rich, and Brian for being here. Um, our family means everything uh, to us, and so one of the incredible honors of um, living here and being here tonight is, is really, um, you know, you guys being here. Uh, where's my mom? All right. Uh, and our heart and soul of the family. It's so nice to be here. Anyway, I already saw Dad looking at his watch, so um, I wanted to start off this with um, the first <laughs> the first quote that I can, because I didn't have time to prep today. Uh, I've been busy working, uh, whereas Dad's been thinking about this talk. Um, I just got out of class at 5.30, rushed over here. And this morning, I'm like, oh, I'm going to put together some thoughts. He's like, what are you going to do? And he goes, the worst case scenario, the worst thing you could do is go along. Uh, and then he, don't go too long. That's all I ask. So, um, and then he said, what are you going to talk about? And so I said, well, I was thinking about talking about how do you create personal signature stories. You're going to talk about company stories. I'm going to talk about personal signature stories. I think that's really interesting. And he goes, mm. <laughs> There's pretty much nothing after that. And if you know Dad, there's one of three ways that he responds after the silence, because he's incapable of maintaining the silence. Like, have you, like, no. Not going to happen. All right, so, so what are the three ways that dad responds after he cannot stop but actually have to say something? The first thing is, huh. And it's actually heard as, huh, huh. Okay. And what that means is, I totally disagree with you, but I'm not going to say it out loud uh, because then you will hang up on me. Uh, so that's, that's what it means. Uh, the second thing is okay, and it's heard as okay. And what that means is I totally disagree with you, but I really don't want you to hang up on me. But I really disagree with you. And the third thing he'll say is no. And what it sounds like is no, 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 no. Like that's basically it's a two-year-old. Like, no, you got it all wrong. And, um, and so that's basically what I heard this morning. <laughs> All three of them. Oh, wait a minute. And then he said, I go, well, he go, <laughs> then he offers suggestions. And he goes, what you really should talk about is purpose. Like, you're killing it with this whole purpose thing. And, uh, and I go, well, I think I might talk about how do you cultivate 
signature stories. He goes, no, 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 no. And so what I'm going to talk about today is how do you create personal signature stories? <laughs> And we have 50 slides, so just buckle in. Uh, we're going to get very comfortable. So how do you create personal signature stories? The first is carve out clear areas of incompetence. Um, by the way, these were all completely inspired by our family um, and my father in particular. Be sneaky. Seek highs and lows and bank your stories. It's fine if they're brief and pithy. So that's what I want to talk about today. Uh, the first thing is carve out clear areas of incompetence. Um, I think it's fair to say, Tommy, that Dad has done an extraordinarily good job of, of carving out these clear areas of incompetence. Early days, he never took a picture. I don't think he's ever actually taken a picture. This is my mom taking a picture of me uh, being held by my dad. He's very good at holding people. He's good at picking clothing. Uh, he's not great at actually taking a picture. Um, very clear in social settings, not good at that. Um, he's also not great at, at elegant eating. So like if you, if you are at a dinner party and you might have like a muffin over here, very good chance you might have a nibble of it and also maybe like have some disastrous in, unintended consequences. Now this sounds like I'm making fun of dad. I'm not making fun of dad. He is a genius. He is a genius. Um, my husband, Andy Smith, is he here? No. All right. <laughs> my husband, Andy Smith, is also a genius. I find a lot of men in my life are geniuses in this way. Um, so carving out clear areas of incompetence, if I could just share a quick story. Um, so Andy, when uh, we got married early on, uh, you know, I decided I wasn't going to be that 70-year-old grandma who took out the garbage. I really wanted my husband to do that. And you know in the first week of marriage, whatever, whoever takes out the garbage first is basically going to take out the garbage for the rest of their life. <laughs> so I knew that. I'm no dummy. God, dad is my dad. Um, and so I said, would you take out the garbage? And he said, yeah, absolutely, I would. So um, when it didn't go out, I thought that was curious, but I wasn't worried. Uh, I said, hmm, you know, probably used words to describe what I wanted. I'll put a calendar request on his calendar, and he will accept it, and then it will go out. So when it didn't go out, I thought that was weird. So I updated the task request on his Google calendar, and I said, garbage goes out, happy face, happy face, exclamation point, exclamation point, in case he was conditioned as a young child to think that garbage going out is a negative thing. I was going to classically condition him to believe it was a positive thing. And so he accepted that update, and it didn't go out. And so... Um, I said, you know, what's going on? Like, why is the garbage not going out? I don't know how to be more clear. Um, and he goes, oh, I would like to take out the garbage, but I'm very confused. Like, what time does it go out? Does it go out on the right-hand side of the driveway or the left-hand side of the driveway? And after they pick it up, do I, when do I take it in? Or I take out the garbage. <laughs> Our kids take out the garbage. Other people take out the garbage now. But it's beautiful. Carving out clear areas of competence not only gives you stories, but it also reduces the amount of time you actually have to do work. So what I've done, by the way, once I learned these techniques from other people, is I decided to actually carve out incompetence around cooking. So not only do I not cook, when I, the few times I do cook and I burn myself, I take a picture and I post it on social media so that people can be clear, I don't cook. This is what happens when I cook. All right, the second, be sneaky and then brand things. In one study, uh, we asked individuals, what's your happiest um, childhood memory? We asked parents, we asked kids, um, and these are the types of answers that were, uh, that were uh, revealed in the study. Uh, constructing leaf forests with my brother, our family read day the day after Christmas, uh, fishing for tadpoles with Jane in the summer, dancing to Michael Jackson's Beat It with my friends, our uh, Linda Evangelista spring cleaning fashion shows, uh, and special days. I said actually special days. So let me tell you what special days are. Special days are when Dad took Jan or Joe or I when we were young, and basically did, he, we were on a need-to-know basis. So, you know, where are we going to go? He was not going to tell us. And so, but he would want to do certain things, like he'd want to go to the Cal game, but we wouldn't want to go, 
So you call it a special day. And so you want to tell us where we're going to go. We're just going to go on a special day. And we were so excited. Oh my God, it's a special day. And then we would arrive at Cal Berkeley and we'd have pom-poms, get them there and cotton candy at the time and stuff. And it, it actually ended up being like ridiculously memorable, a fantastic story. And actually, um, you know, I'm here right now talking about it. And so he was sneaky in very systematic ways and then he would brand them as special days. I mean, it's genius, right? He probably took us on five. Bomb, who did way more stuff with us, no, I'm just no offense, um, did not brand those things as special days, and now we remember the special days. Um, <laughs> third, seek highs and lows. So when you think of personal signature stories, you're really not thinking of like, I was winning, a winning, 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 won, got the promotion, whatever. You're really thinking about highs and lows. These are the opportunities for stories, right? Um, so when dad says intriguing, authentic, involving, involving a big piece of that is feeling like you're going on a high and a low and so you're designing these roller coasters. And that makes sense, right? Because when we see movies like James Bond, they all have highs and lows. Uh, the arc here is, wow, what happened? I don't know. He gets the girl. Uh, and every single James Bond film, you know, has that arc. Uh, or Jurassic Park, you know, what's going on? T-Rex. What's going on? Big T-Rex. What's going on? Big, big T-Rex. So arcs don't have to be sophisticated, they just have to have some highs and lows. Or Casablanca, which has these like sort of micro story themes in it. And so when you're finding signature stories for yourself, uh, or your family, or your life, you're looking for those highs and lows, which is a really exciting way to actually raise kids, for example. Because when the lows hit, you know it's going to be a great story. And if you can have a comedic lens, that allows them to take risks, and you don't take things so seriously. Um, it also allows you to sort of document things. So I wanted to mention that Disneyland is, as I think we can all agree, the worst place ever. <laughs> very, very unhappy place. But most people don't remember that because they don't take pictures of like the unhappy moments. Uh, we do. Uh, we do, and we also write it up in our holiday card. I'll share um, one from a few years back. Cooper, one of our sons, um, wrote, I highlighted the year, Disneyland. We prepared for the trip for weeks, filling our jean pockets with cookies for sustenance and brushing up on our Disneyland history. Um, on arrival, though, uh, we found that the parking was painful, tickets expensive, lines long. On the upside, my dad found an iPhone app with a GPS-driven map, ranked attraction checklist, and crowdsourced wait time guide to get us around the park strategically, optimizing our fun while minimizing lines. Unfortunately, the iPhone died in 30 minutes. Necessity forced us to try something arguably better, a cleverly color-coded, conveniently foldable, pocket-sized tool. It's called a map. It's provided by Disneyland. It's amazingly free, the only free thing at Disneyland. So that was fortuitous. On the way out, we met Sandra, our au pair, and Taya Sloan, our sister, outside the haunted house, where Sandra was shaking from heat stroke. Being a doctor, my mom recommended she eat some grapes. Seconds later, Sandra's body decided to put the grapes in reverse. And we left with Sandra to find a place with less bad advice and fewer bystanders. She slept the entire car ride home, and we were required to be silent for the whole time, so it ended up on a, oh, no, we can't wait to go back. <laughs> so now the question is, why would you see highs and lows? Why? Well, I know Disneyland's awful. Um, why would I go with my family besides you know, they're my family and I should go. Um, you know, what's actually experienced is, you know, you get there to Disneyland and then you get in lines and you don't realize how long they are. And then you get to, you know, Small World, which is branded the happiest place on earth. True, I'm not sure. But then you take a picture of Devin literally crying, which I always find hilarious. And then they're tired, you know, Cooper and Devin, our twins are on Andy's lap, fatigued. But then you get the fireworks and then you forget the cotton candy all over their face and Taya's a mess and our au pair is throwing up. But you just remember the end, right? You remember the peak and you remember the end and that has disproportionate impact. So if we seek highs and lows, if we design for memories rather than just experience, uh, we'll cultivate a life of story. 
And last, bank your stories, even if they're short and pithy. Uh, we talk a lot about sort of six-word stories, and I find this to be a really you know, powerful tool. Larry Smith and um, others have actually generalized this concept, but it was really born by Hemingway, who once wrote, baby sho shoes for sale, never worn. So I make my students in the Power of Story class uh, write six-word stories to describe them lo their lives, and, and you all uh, shared stories. Um, so we're going to share a few of these stories um, that you, um, I'll just like have you look at them and see if we could have like a little, you know, vote on which one's best. Dad, which one did you say you liked? There's a few that you really liked. Like the NBA theater. The NBA theater. Get lucky once, twice. Get lucky once, twice. Yeah, and uh, ambition with purpose. Yeah, Robert Talmani, who's not here, but had a huge impact, just huge impact on my life. For the two years I was at Haas, uh, he led to The Dragonfly Effect, was a book that Andy and I wrote together with um, Carly Adler. I also like Married the Wrong Girl, Fixed It. Um, you know, but the best, the best was Kay Ockers. So, Kay, you get um, the award for best six-word story we got here. Thank you, Rich. Um, and for the others, we're going to have three runners-up, which we will um, tell you about later. And you will get some books. <laughs> Ocker on branding. Um, these six-word stories are really important. You can, you can do them in the day. You can have your kids do them at night. You can, instead of having a conversation about what you did today um, over the dinner table, you could have a conversation about what story was unlocked. And how many of you have soulless conversations at the dinner table about what you do today? And Laura, what are you going to do tomorrow? Like, that was one thing. Like, you were always, Dad, so averse to us talking about logistics. Um, but that's what defines our life. It's to-do lists oftentimes. It's logistics. It's goals that we think are really important. But what actually defines our lives are the stories. And if you think of your wedding, if you had one, or potentially, you know, Someday you might die, and the memorial that you might have. What are the stories that are shared? It's not a set of lists. It's not a set of things that you accomplished. It's uh, the stories that others remember about you. Um, so bank the stories, even if it's six words or, or less. Um, and bank those stories that are distinct, that make you or your family uh, truly distinct, um, bold. And so you take risks that are relevant uh, to different audiences. Uh, Dad talked a lot about authenticity and truth. Uh, we're living in a time right now where there's a significant trust deficit. Uh, we don't trust necessarily our politicians. We don't trust oftentimes leaders. And it's not just the finance industry. It's, it's everywhere. But what people trust is people they know, people whose story they believe in. And so cultivating those stories becomes really, really important. And codifying them and capturing them does as well these bold stories, these memorable stories so that they stick over time, stories that are uh, shareable so that they can spread and garner action, and stories that depict something larger, something meaningful. So I just wanted to end with um, one of my favorite quotes. Uh, tell me the truth, facts, and I'll learn. Tell me the truth, and I'll believe. But tell me a story, and it will live in my heart forever. Thank you. By the way, there's, oops, um, we have some questions. We do. All right. Well, I, I may, Should I sit here? I, why don't you sit here, and David, if, okay. if you would come up as well. So we, you submitted questions, and thank you for that in advance. Uh, I'll just kick this off, but I know I think you have some lists, some, some, some other questions. With this first question, which I guess is a little bit personal, but I'll start with it, because I know a lot of you had this on your mind. Uh, Jennifer and David Auker, would you tell us your signature stories, please, each of you? Thank you. You want me to start? Yeah. Well, in, in the middle 80s, I was teaching strategy at Berkeley, and I'd written a book on strategy. And uh, it, I came to realize that, that people were too focused on short-term profits and driven by the stock market and, and um, others, not to blame Rich for th that, but uh, he was one of them. Uh, he was part of the evil. Uh, empire, but um, um, 
Yeah, I, I, gee, I'm tempted to tell. I used to, when I was side by side with him, I used to go over and say, you know, if, if I spent so much time with students, I could win the Best Teacher Award, too. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, so I said, how, how can I do this? How can I influence this? And I decided I wanted to spend the rest of my career teaching people to manage for the long term, which to me meant to build assets instead of driving short-term financials. And so I said, what, what kind of asset should I do? And, and uh, given my background, and I had background in market research, in strategy, and in advertising, and, uh, and also I uh, realized that brand equity was starting to be, become a, a topic of conversation, and I thought it, it should be brands. That's where I fit. And, uh, and I looked at other kinds of assets of a firm, and, and I wasn't very relevant to any of them. So I decided to help people uh, build brands as a way to, to focus on assets instead of financials. And um, so I kind of grandiosely said, I'm going to try to change the way people think of marketing and the way they think of brands and the way they run their business. And uh, you know, I would be embarrassed to to say that then, but now I'm older, who cares? <laughs> and uh, so anyway, that's how I started in branding. I wrote my first book sort of defining brand equity and my second book on how do you manage brand equity. And since then, I continue to write branding books and be really focused on, on that basic problem, how to get people to think more strategically. That's fantastic. Um, I would say my equivalent of that one would be, um, I never wanted to be in marketing. So I... So you're implying you now are in marketing? No, I'm still not. In, I'm, I'm even less in marketing than I ever was. But my goal was to always be a great, hopefully, um, a great mom, hopefully a great partner. Um, Andy, this is where you say, like, yes, nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I wanted to be a great friend, uh, hopefully an athlete, and, and hopefully contribute back to something in the world, um, and wanted to do great in my career, but I just didn't know what it was. And I think, you know, when you talk to executives, anyone, um, you find out that a lot of people have closet careers. Like, they always wanted to be this, but they didn't know how or whatever. And so for me, that closet career was to be an oncologist. Um, you know, my mom's um, father, my grandfather, died of cancer at an early age. She's worked for hospice now for, gosh, 40 years, um, Meals on Wheels, um, with um, others in the room. And it just had a personal impact, even though I didn't see it personally. But I think all of us have been touched by cancer. And so um, that was what was really important to me. But I couldn't see my way to being an oncologist, but also having these other goals to be, you know, all of these other things. And so um, I saw my dad be this remarkable dad uh, who ha was so good with time management and so fantastic with ideas and science. And, um, I, you know, I just I thought it was so inspirational. So that's why I became a behavioral scientist. And so, um, but every Sunday I would feel a little bit depressed. I don't know how many of you guys on Sundays or like one day a week, you just get kind of get depressed. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and I try like 10 years depression on Sundays. Like I saw it coming, it hit, it was consistent. And I thought, you know, is it that I have a lack of friends? <laughs> is it that I, you know, what is it? And I, but it had something to do with meaning for me. I just felt not very connected to something that was truly meaningful. So, um, so fast forward, I got recruited back to Stanford. I was lucky enough to join Berkeley for two years. And thank you for those of you who took my class and are here. You mean a lot to me. Um, I have a deep, deep love for uh, Berkeley and, and, and Bears. And, um, but then I went back to Stanford. Um, but um, um, I do have a, a feeling of a kind of what's right for me. And when I came back to Stanford, which felt very right for me, 
um, at the time, I had the opportunity to basically um, really resonate with a story that Robert Chatwani, a Haas MBA, shared with me on the last day of my class, which was called Creativity and Innovation. And in this story, he told, um, I told about his, his best friend, Samir, many of you guys know this story, um, who had leukemia. And Robert, because he's so strategic, so creative, so confidence without attitude, he was able to come up with a framework, a way of thinking about harnessing story and social media to get over 25,000 people in the bone marrow registry in order to find a perfect match for Samir, and he did that. And it was just such a mesmerizing story for me that, um, that Andy and I, I I went back that night and actually shared with him the story, and we ended up writing a book based on it. And I never wanted to write a book. That was Dad's thing. And, um, but it literally felt compelled to me. And, um, and, and I could go on and on about the reverberating effects of that signature story. But um, even though I never became an oncologist, I felt like donating a year of my life to try and get more people on the bone marrow registry and still now really feeling connected to that very meaningful thing, A, I no longer have empty Sundays. I feel very full on Sundays. Um, and B, we have this book, which is why you wrote so many of your books that, you know, you know, it creates legacy, it creates meaning. And so that's one of my signature stories. And I have so many more too, but um, hopefully you'll all be thinking of like, in every domain of your life, one signature story that really defines you. And if you haven't yet, please do so tonight. It would make us incredibly happy just even writing it down with six words or less, just the title, and then sharing it with your, your loved ones. That would, that would be a big successful night. All right, so I'm gonna jump in and ask a couple of questions. Um, all right, so um, let's see. How do you create a po powerful personal story when you're working in an ordinary job? I don't know if Marissa's here, but Marissa asked that question that dad loved. So I'm gonna ask it to you. Uh, I don't think this is how it works. We both answer these questions. But well, anyway, I will, I'll, if I'll, I have something interesting yeah. to say. Anyway, uh, um, well, I think that uh, if you're in a position in an organization to, to create a higher purpose or to maybe activate a higher purpose that is in the organization by creating a program or, or something, then you should do that. I think that... Uh, uh, you know, that, that it, it just provides meaning in the lives of employees and it provides respect for the, the people that do business with your organization. But if you're not in a position to do that, you know, you might consider uh, having another life, another professional life as a volunteer, perhaps, with an organization that does have a higher purpose that you really admire. I totally disagree. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, I think that was a great answer. I see why you put that first, because you wanted to talk about purpose. It, you know, basically, you're going to fit that in. Well, I was just trying to help you out, because purpose is kind of your thing now, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> After carving out clear areas of incompetence, oh. it will be my thing. Um, it's true. Um, I teach a class uh, with Emily Ma um, at, at, at X, Google X, and um, it's called Rethinking Purpose. The other thing I would add to, to that, um, that answer is that a lot of times, there's, in fact, there's data by Gallup and others that show that, um, at least in the United States, uh, over 50% of the people working at their institutions don't understand um, the purpose of their institution or their mission. Uh, and of those that do, 80% don't care. So, I mean, it's, it's really, it's, it's just huge data sets, and it's a starkly, um, you know, depressing, you know, trend. So what happens if you're at this ordinary job and there's no sort of higher purpose there? Um, what, one interesting thing about the purpose research is that um, purpose oftentimes is thought of this, like, you know, purpose with a big capital P, but it actually is a lowercase p oftentimes. And so everyone thinks it's sort of this destination, this inspired mission. I wanted to be an oncologist. I'm going to make a dent in cancer. But more often than not, purpose is um, designed much more from this lowercase p perspective. It's what you're doing in the day to day. Um, are you learning? Do you feel like you're accessing some unique strengths? Are you um, passionate about your, what you're doing? And do you feel like what you're doing is what the world needs? And those are the elements that get you into flow. 
um, that and whether you really like the people you're working with or at least have one best friend um, at your organization. And so if you can just kind of get into that sort of lowercase p mentality, that will often ride you out. Um, okay, I'm going to have another question. What advice do you have for individuals and organizations faced with the rival who generates powerful stories that are patently untrue? This is Steve's question. Well, uh, I, I'm a great believer that you know the best story wins and the, the last heard story wins. So you've got to really change the conversation. I think you need to create your own signature story and and uh, and make that more prominent than this this one that is. You know, if if you look at uh, uh, Walmart, for example, there was a time when 9% of the world wouldn't even shop at Walmart because they were so disgusted with a lot of their policies. And then Walmart created this, this alternative conversation. They sort of uh, went green. They got religion about environmental things. They're doing enormous stuff on that. They, they uh, are working with the community. And, uh, and they really... Uh, provided at least an alternate conversation. At least when you talk about Walmart, you don't have to talk about how they treat their employees and how they buy from China and, and how they treat their suppliers and so on. There's an, uh, as an option. So I think you have to create a competitive strategic story or a signature story that, that, uh, uh, that wins the day against the, the one that's false. Totally disagree. I'm just kidding. Um, another way to think about it is um, listening better to what that story is and the language that's being used by that um, competitor or the audience. And I've been thinking a lot about this right now. It feels like we're living in a, a relatively de uh, divisive world. Um, one reason, one of the many reasons we're so happy to be here today is not just because of our deep love for Rich and um, and also you know what Haas has been able to. Um, I think create for you and also for us more generally, but also um, this this also this this ability to bridge Stanford and Berkeley. It's it's a very you know sort of small divisive you know kind of funny um, you know competitive environment, but it's it's still very gratifying to be able to make these sort of small dents. When you're in divisive environments where there's um, it's not clear what's truth and what's not, when there's um, different people and, and, and organizations and groups that have alternative narratives that are very stuck in their head, all of us. Um, it, what I find to be interesting and, and useful, and then it's backed by um, a significant amount of social science as well, is understanding and feeling empathy for individuals who have a very different narrative, even if it's patently, patently false. And understanding the language that they're using, where they're coming from, and so, um, and before you potentially design a counter narrative. Um, and so, understanding, having empathy, and understanding language, and then aligning where there's some common thread feels to be, to me, um, quite inspiring and hopeful. Do we have time for another question, Rich? OK. Um, I'm just going to. All right, I'm going with James Tinsley. How have signature stories changed in recent years? Are we telling the same stories through different media? Or are we telling fundamentally different stories? I can go if you don't. You go okay. ahead. <laughs> um, I thought this was such an interesting question. And the reason is because I think we're, because we're living in such a trust deficit, um, and that stories and, and people that you trust is so important, authenticity is at such a premium. And um, I know it's an overused kind of trendy word in many regards, but there's something really important about uh, stories that not only um, are authentic, but they feel authentic. And I think that's a really significant trend that's happening. It's not a qualitatively different type of story per se, but it has implications. Like, you know, is it always going to be pretty, 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 like most marketing or manufactured, you know, goods? Or is there going to be some highs and lows? Look at the dad story that dad shared. You know, it wasn't like happy, 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 right? There was some highs and there was lows. Um, a second, I think, uh, shift is that I think people need to design for partners more that you need to feel like you're part of a story. So it's not just like, I'm going to share with you a story and you're going to receive it. 
But if you feel part of the story, uh, and this is what Dragonfly and Robert Chalwani's story was all about, if you feel part of it, then you'll get people aligned. And if you get people aligned and they feel part of the story, you can actually make action happen. And, um, and I think we're all living in a world right now where it's very important for us to be aligned at, at what um, is good in the world and how we can make action toward that, what we believe in and, and how we can make progress happen uh, together. There's a phrase that um, I'll just end with, which is people want to be uh, valued members of a winning team on an inspired mission. And you don't have to be winning all the time, but um, have you heard this before? Um, but you need to have a pathway toward winning. And I like that sentence because you have to have clarity in that inspired mission. You have to have people knowing what role on the team do they have. I think another uh, really important thing in the branding world is energy. And we know that brands have been declining for 15 years all around the world. The exception are those brands with energy. And it's really hard to get energy into a brand. And one of the reasons that we, a practical reason we want a higher purpose is because they will give energy to the brand. You look at Lifebuoy, I mean, they make bar soap. It is pretty hard to create energy for bar soap, but help a child reach five and uh, three videos that got 44 million exposures, that's energy. And, and, it, and it gives life to, uh, to one of the great global brands, which is Lifebuoy. Um, fantastic. We have one last question. Um, how do you create a six-word story or any signature story? This is Linda. Uh, I have nothing to say about that. Okay. All right. Um, one thing I would, I don't know if Linda's here, but um, what I would say is you're always thinking about change or transformation. So think about your life. You know, what, what did you used to be and what are you now? So how did you sort of change? And that, that usually gets you away from like, I am this, I do this, I'm going to do this, et cetera, that kind of linear progression. As you start to figure out signature stories, you know, baby shoes, for sale, never worn, there's an arc to it. And there is kind of a reveal to it. Um, and so think of, of, of transformation and change. And I think right now, again, I think all of us really um, <coughs> Are, are, are in a stronger place if we're adaptable, if we're open to change, and we're able to transform. So that would be my one tip. Thank you. Please join me in thanking these two wonderful friends and scholars of all of us. Thank you. Thank you both. You know, I think it was maybe a year and a half ago that I saw Jennifer and, and we, this idea came up and we thought, oh, if we could only get you two together and I'm so happy we were able to make this happen. Um, when, I was, when I was seven, my brothers were 14 and 15. And one of the things I remember so distinctly is my parents driving us to Half Moon Bay. We had one of those woody station wagons and, and we filled it with pumpkins. It was early, early October. And we brought those pumpkins back to our home. And our parents let us sell those pumpkins. We had a, a stand in front of the neighborhood, and we sold those pumpkins. And, and that was a thrill for me. That was a thrill for me. And two years later, I may have been about nine, and my brothers were near the end of high school. We had graduated to jewelry. We, we were, they were in the puka shell business. Uh, <laughs> high volume, low margin. I was seven years younger, I didn't like the business. I was doing tiger eye, turquoise, much higher priced, higher quality stuff. And, <laughs> but I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I got to go to Berkeley as an undergrad and I come from a business family, if you hadn't noticed from those stories, and I wanted to go into business and I knew it thrilled me. I was a sophomore and I'd taken intermediate macroeconomics at Berkeley. And one of my faculty, one of the faculty members, the teacher, I'd never talked to her one-on-one. -on -one. She comes up to me after handing back the midterm, and I, I had done pretty well in the midterm. And she said, come see me, please, in my office. And I went to go see her. Her name is Fran Van Lu. And she said, have you ever thought about getting a PhD in economics? Neither of my parents had a four-year degree. That was not an identity I'd ever even thought about. And 
I walked out of her office never having thought about that. Um, a couple weeks later, she got me together with somebody named George Akerlof. I didn't know who George Akerlof was. He subsequently won a Nobel Prize. But she wanted me to sort of talk to somebody who had done that. And we can't be what we can't see. So when people ask me, why does this institution mean so much to you? You know, that's, that's my story. And I think a lot of us have a story like that, whether your story is connected to Stanford or Berkeley or, you know, these institutions matter. And it's why we're so invested in them. It's why we come together around them. And that's part of why we keep them strong and we must keep them strong. So uh, whichever of those two institutions you're part of, keep leaning into them because they just matter so much. Thanks for coming out tonight. Go Bears. <laughs> I'd like to thank Rich Lyons and the Hawes Alumni Group for putting this event on and inviting our friends from Stanford. And I, I hope you've had a chance to think about signature stories and apply them in your organization. Right, so think about signature stories both at work and in life and, and even in the day to day when you're having your next dinner meal with your family. Uh, think about actually sharing a story rather than necessarily sharing what you did today or what you're gonna do tomorrow. I'm not saying you know you have to cook, I'm just saying, of course not. ask people right. what their story is. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.